All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Gaudium at Spaz22.com blog posts on Podbean podcast and on YouTube. And the Podbean podcast can be picked up on Spotify and Apple, not Google, however, because Google being the Antichrist made me jump through all kinds of hoops I didn't want to jump through. So it's not on Google. I, I've never mentioned that before. Anyway, I have today a repeat guest. I've had this guest on once before. Very excited to have him back. Dr. Roland Milliare, uh, who is down in Houston. And uh, I just told you off camera, I lost my cheat sheet. Normally, that wouldn't be a bad thing because I could remember. But you have a long description as to your, you know, where it is that you work, John Paul, something or other, something or other. So I'm going to have you uh, please introduce yourself to our guest, Dr. Miyare. Uh, what is your title? Where do you work? And so on. Well, first of all, I just married up in the world, right? So I'm husband of Veronica, Veronica Rose Miliari. Uh, so I, but as far as you know, our purposes are the vice president of curriculum at the St. John Paul II Foundation based here in, in Houston, Texas, is you know, national apostolate serving married couples, uh, healthcare professionals, and clergy. And then I'm speaking of clergy, director of clergy initiatives. And then, you know, about one semester, I'm adjuncting, adjunct professor of theology, University of Dallas. I've adjuncted the local seminary here in Houston for the Diocese of Fort Worth, and then the Diactal Institute at the Josephinum. So a lot of, uh, a lot of, yeah, so you, um, you, a lot of ecclesial institutions too. So where did you get your doctorate? I, the University of St. Mary of the Lake at, at Mundelein. In Mundelein, the, yes. Then, uh, yeah, with the then Father Father Barron, you know, Bishop Barron was oh, just the named the rector, named rector president. At, at, the, at the time, I I thought I was going to have him as a as a, pre, as, a as a professor. Uh, and then I had, of course, we've talked about this, one of your former professors, Father Edward Oaks, right? The great Jesuit. Yes. May he rest. It may he rest. He, he passed away while working there of pancreatic cancer. Gosh, it's been about 10 years now. I think. Yeah. That, and it was, uh, it was, and it was, qu it was quick. Uh, and the great grace, you know, pun intended, he finished that work on nature, nature and grace. That's what he wanted yeah. to yeah, do, I, so. I think it's called Grace and Six Questions or something or other. And something it was his it was his final his final thing. Those who know me know he was my doctoral dissertation director uh, and helped me negotiate the shark infested Ronarian waters of Fordham University in the early 90s. I was a young scholar doing a Balthazar dissertation. And what a lot of and this pertains to the subject we're going to talk about today, this does pertain to uh current issues in the in the sense that a lot of people today a lot of very traditionalist thinkers today equate balthazar with modernism and being liberal and, and mainly because of his views on hell and you know they consign him to hell for for his views on hell and balthazar himself said you know the left wing has long since been done with me and now the right wing has thrown me on the dung heap uh so he goes you know i don't know what the heck i'm doing right or wrong but the fact is, is that back in the day when Balthazar was first being translated into English and, and introduced to the American and English speaking world, he was considered a very right wing theologian because he supported Humani Vitae. He opposed the ordination of women and so on. But anyway, that's what Ed Oaks helped me to negotiate. That's the basis of this long winded story to get a Balthazar. And actually, I, you know. I, I remember taking because Mundelein's approach was to go through dogmatic the theology in these historical blocks. So I had for you know, with Father Oaks, I think at the time it's called history, history of Christian thought, you know, five or six. But it went, of course, we read, you know, Balthazar, we read Rahner. Um, and then I wrote a paper in that class on Guardini and, you know, Father Oaks, you know, wrote on the paper, see me and said, hey, you should try to get this published. And I mean, I'm a, you know, young, dumb graduate student. Uh, and I, you know, but yeah. that's what I did. I I, I, he, I said, where should I? And he said, try these journals. And, and then Haythrop hey Journal, you know, published the, the article on. What Romano was the Guardini. article? So I, I, uh, it was on, uh, you know, Romano Guardini, in particular, the, the notion of the primacy of, of logos uh, over ethos, which is, you know, ethos, which is kind of, you know, carried me, you know, carried me yeah, on. Carried you on through. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, I too think. Uh, yeah, so Ed Oaks died of pancreatic cancer while there at Mundelein. And, and, you know, as long as we're on the topic, my viewers always like book recommendations. 
uh, one of the greatest pieces of secondary literature on the theology of von Balthasar. If you've never read a word of Balthasar and you want to get introduced to him, sometimes it's best to begin with the secondary literature that takes a global view. Because, you know, Balthasar is one of these thinkers where uh, no matter where you dive into his thinking, the whole is contained in the part. And in many ways, you don't understand the part unless you understand the whole. It's very global in that sense. And he has some more topical writings, yes, but in some sense, the difficulty of wrestling with Balthazar is you have to know the whole. And reading a book like Ed Oaks, Ed Oaks wrote a book called The Pattern of Redemption mm -hmm. or Pattern of Redemption, which I think remains to this day the greatest piece of secondary literature, introducing people to the thought of Hans Urs von Balthazar in English today. He has, also has a book on the theology of grace, which is excellent. I can't remember the exact title. Uh, and then another one I, on Christology, which I used in class, which is excellent, called Infinity Dwindled to Infancy. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a great it's a great text. Uh, and and yeah. Father Oaks was a great was a great essayist. I mean, just really, oh, you know, gosh. very. I mean, talk about liber liberally learned. I mean, people should go back and reread some of his articles and first things. I mean, just, you know, remarkable. yeah, I, I in personal opinion is even though I'm uh, I know Rusty Reno, the editor of First Things, and I admire him to a great extent. I think that when Father Newhouse passed away, I think Ed Oaks should have become the editor at First Things. Uh, but that's just my private op opinion about things. But anyway, I'm talking way too much. This is supposed to be an interview of you, uh, <laughs> Dr. Miliare. And the topic today actually is not unrelated to Balthazar, or, or Guardini, or Ed Oaks. And these, the, the topic we want to talk about today is uh, what we call the dream team. Uh, the the coming together of Pope John Paul II, you know, elected in 1978, died in 2004, right, 2004, and uh, and and then Joseph Ratzinger, who was eventually Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who was head of the uh, CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is now the DDF for some strange reason, I have no idea. Uh, and uh, while he was at the CDF, Rod Singer made some important decisions uh, at the behest of John Paul. So let's start there. Uh, why Why do you call, you were the one who came up with this, why do you call this the dream team, Roland? And what was significant about the relationship of Rod Singer and JP2? What did they accomplish that was so important? Well, I mean, both of them are, are men of the council, right? I mean, both were both participate in the council in different ways. The then Wojtyla as Archbishop of Krakow, Joseph Ratzinger as a pair to his two cardinal friends. Um, you know, both had roles in in shaping, you know, the docu var varying documents. You know, um, Father Jared Wicks, a Jesuit from the Gregorian, right? He has done good, good scholarship on the role of Ratzinger and what we now refer to as, as Dei Verbo, right? Uh, you know, the remember yeah. there, that was a, a quite a controversial document, right? In fact, the initial schema, right, you know, was 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 scrapped. It just wouldn't, it wasn't workable. It was called De Fontibus or, you know, on De the Fontibus, sources. The sources, yes. Yeah. Um, and so they were, you know, men of of the council who, who tried to, you know, give us the a proper hermeneutic, right, to approach Vatican II. I mean, uh, as we, as you and I both know, right, there is all kinds of debate now more than ever, it seems, uh, with respect to Vatican II. But those, the the dream team, focused in on the the Christocentric center, right? I mean, they honed in on the name of your 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 blog, the podcast, Gaudium et Spes twenty two. Uh, I mean, and you know, the then Karawatiwa was involved, instrumental in the the drafting of. That document, uh, and then Joseph Ratzinger himself wrote a commentary on the document. Uh, and at times, highly critical. He calls it downright Pelagian at at times, uh, naively yes. optimistic. But they both focus in on that Christocentric anthropology. In fact, Ratzinger says it's the first time, you know, the history of a magisterial document. You have this intersection of of Christology and anthropology, right? Gaudium and Spes twenty two. You know, Christ fully reveals man to himself and brings to light, right, or makes, you know, his supreme yeah. calling clear. Uh, and this is, you know, and really for both of them, they're about communio. They're about communion. John Paul focuses on the, you know, communio personarum, communion of persons, you know, the importance of a Trinitarian Christology. 
I mean, that's not to say that Joseph Ratzinger isn't interested in that project, but he's also more focused on communio ecclesiology, Eucharistic ecclesiology. And then both yeah. of them ultimately are focused on that love that's derived from from that notion of of communio. Uh, and that I mean, that's why I mean, some people were startled that, you know, Pope Benedict's first encyclical was on love, Deus Caritas S. But it makes perfect sense. In fact, Father, I think it's Father Vincent Toomey, one of his former doctoral yes. students, said, he, "Yeah, he thought it, he, he was not surprised at all, and he, in fact, he anticipated as as much, right? I mean, which is not a surprise given the Augustinian, um, you know, roots of of Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth. Yeah. And they're and they're, I, comp, they're complementary. They're comp, You know, there's a complementarity between the two of them, right? I mean." You know, Wojtyla, yeah. a you know, arguably a Thomist, right? A Thomist that's rooted in, you know, the film, uh, you know, phenomenological method, right? Joseph Ratzinger, more of an Augustinian, Bonaventurian thinker. Uh, it's not to say he is anti-Thomist, right? And not to say that, you know, Wojtyla is anti-Augustin by no means, right? But but the two of them together okay. make up this this dream team, right? I mean, as Archbishop of Krakow. I mean, you know, think of sources of renewal. I mean, John Paul wanted to make sure Vatican II is interpreted and implemented properly, right? So let's you know use the, this foundation of the Christocentric anthropology, and then I think in 1985 the the Ratzinger Report, right? When they had that synod on the proper meaning of of Vatican II, right? The whole notion of communio ecclesiology was put forward. This is the proper hermeneutic i mean so that's what makes them the dream team in, in my view right this yeah you know communio anthropology communio ecclesiology all rooted in, in christ as a center so i think that's so true uh and i did people often say why did you name your blog with such a mouthful gaudium et spes 22 uh when it could have been something simpler like my absolutely correct opinions of everything.com you know, something like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's actually the name of a book by a Polish philosopher, Kolakowski. He once wrote a book, My Absolutely Correct Opinions on Everything, or something along those lines. And I always remembered that. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the central focus in my mind, the central importance of Vatican II is that Christocentric theological anthropology. And, you know, I didn't make that up. That comes from just about any, you know, major communio thinker who was at the council, interprets the council, saying, yeah, that, yeah, and I think it was Ratzinger called GS-22 a little Christological time bomb, in, you know, in, in the middle of the, the, the text. Now, okay, you are correct. Let's come back to Gaudium et Spes a second, because really, I agree with you. The dream team is is that these two thinkers I think, and it's the result of divine providence, were brought together by God in Rome to help the church retrieve the riches of the Second Vatican Council in an era when that council had been co-opted and literally mauled and destroyed by the liberal wing of the church. I know those are hackneyed terms. My friend Mike Baxter makes fun of me all the time for using these terms, but I think people know what I mean. Whatever, whatever you want to call them, the marauders, the barbarians who destroyed the Catholic Church after the second, you know, elements of the after the Vatican Council. These two guys, the dream team, tried to retrieve the council for the sake of the church because there was something there to retrieve. OK, all that said, I agree with you. That's that's what's important about them. I want to come back then to one of the most contentious elements of that council, Gaudium et Spes. I have long held the opinion, and I get this from Joseph Ratzinger and from Balthazar, that Gaudium et Spes is of uneven quality, to say the least. The first half is much better than the second half. Hansen was von Balthasar referred to the second half of Gaudium et Spes as dilettantish, and Ratzinger refers to it as almost Pelagian. Um, so what, what, it, what, what would you say then? It, it, would you agree with my assessment? Let's just start there. Is the first half of Gaudium et Spes better than the second half? And I would say yes. And the reason is because it has a Christological anthropology. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, I, I'd say Gaudium et Spes is a grab bag. It's definitely you see, look, this is what happens when committees, you know, put together a document. And it's just I mean, it's long. It's unwieldy. And look, if you took out the Christocentric center, what would be left? I mean, it could very well eat just as easily be 
a humanist manifesto, right? I th I think we have to, to yeah, you know, yeah, to name it that way, right? But that's but going back to Guardini, it's all about the primacy of the logos over the ethos, right? And so the logos is this notion of of Gaudium et Spes twenty two, this Christocentric center. The ethos is self giving love. Gaudium et Spes twenty four, right? We discover ourselves only through a complete, complete and sincere gift of self. The problem with the latter part of of Gaudium et Spes is it it seems to forget that that primacy, right? It becomes, I mean, this the document could have been written by an NGO, right? I mean, the way it, yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's formulated it's that is the problem. You know? Yeah. Uh... I've read and it, uh, it tra it Tracy Rowland. Tracy Rowland has highlighted what it's got him as best 36. You know, she's critical of the use of the, the, this notion of autonomy, right? The autonomy of. Yes, the, I was just going to say of this. The, oh, yeah. Autonomy of the world, the autonomy of of culture, right? These things, especially the word culture, right? They're not neutral, right? In fact, the word culture is related to cultus, to worship. Uh, but if we if we cede that ground, we allow culture to be you know, neutral and the world, but then we've got, then we have problems, you know, we will compromise again and again, and we will wake up and real and, and see that the church has become more of an NGO and it's forgotten yeah. the divine mission and trusted to her. So. And to give people some, I agree with that completely. I like Tracy Rowland's analysis here. I'd forgotten about Tracy's uh, analysis of that sort of neutral language. Uh, it almost in some ways, well, Back up a second. I've read accounts of Vatican II by historians of the council, and they are right about this, that one of the big currents, I mean, Gaudium et Spes was the last document put out by the council in 1965, in the very last session. And the debate really was between those who wanted a very Christocentric anthropological approach uh, to things without a great deal of commentary on the glories of the modern world <laughs> and our role in being solidarity with the great forces of the good in the world today. But the, the other side wanted to, the, the document to read more like Pope John the 23rd's encyclical Pach, Pachamanteris. Uh, it's John the 23rd, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Pachamanteris. And uh, Peace in the World. And in, that document is addressed to the whole world and not to, to the bishops or to the Catholic. That document is oriented towards the world. Like you said, it could almost, it's a great document. It's a great encyclical. But there were council fathers at Vatican II that wanted Gaudium et Spes to read almost like this NGO, something addressed to the whole world. Um, and, I, and I think that's the deeply problematic part, because then it does start to sound Pelagian. You know, in fact, another way, I mean, as far as hermeneutics of Vatican II documents, you know, Cardinal Dulles, you know, he, you know, putting the different documents under each of these two figures, he says, under Ratzinger, you could put Dei Verbum, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Lumen Gentium, versus, you know, John Paul, Wittiwa, you you put Gaudium et Spes, Dignitatis Humanae. I mean, the logos really are those first three foundational documents, right? Dei Verbum, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and then Lumen Gentium, and then you could look at Gaudium et Spes as the the ethos that 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 flows out of it, uh, and let's face it, we continue to battle, you know, this this hermeneutic, right? When when Benedict, uh, what was it in two thousand eight, the, the famous general audience, um, you know, with the with the Roman Curia, um, before we we scolded, I guess the Roman Curia at Christmas time. Uh, there was a time when we, you know, the. <laughs> The, then the then Benedict the sixteenth you know talked about the two different hermeneutics the hermeneutic of you know, of uh, you know of reform in continuity sometimes just called you know hermeneutic continuity and then the hermeneutic of a rupture or or discontinuity and the, these two men they're the dream team because they represent that continuity I mean they you know John yeah. Paul II I mean just the breadth of all these encyclicals the revision of the code and canon law and the gift of the catechism. You know, and then, of course, I mean, the writings of, you know, there's more limited papal writing, but with Ratzinger, I mean, just a whole breadth of, you know, theological writings we're going to continue to to mine. I mean, between the two of them, right, the, you know, the table's been set, right? We have, you know, these, you know, great interpretations of of theology, of the relationship between faith and reason, so on and so forth, Um and so, yeah. frankly, you don't necessarily need a uh, a theologian pope, and so hence, I think, why we have a 
And currently, we have a pastoral pope. Um, you know, I, I wish it weren't always kind of pastoral theology on the fly, literally, but it's 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 where it's it's where we are. Uh, but between right. the two, you had a, yeah. a philosopher, pope, and a theologian. You know, th that was a, a winning combo. Yeah, it was a winning combo, and and I don't want to get bogged down in criticism of Pope Prent. People think, you know, I don't. They, I get it from the right and the left. The, the right, the ultra right, doesn't like me because I refuse to call Pope Francis a heretic. You know, you know he's, you know, a false pope, whatever. And then the left gets mad at me because I am critical of Pope Francis from time to time. But mainly, my criticism of him is is that I, I find that his pontificate is more like the elements of Gaudium et Spes that I don't like than it is about the elements of Gaudium et Spes that I do. There's a, in my opinion, there's a dilettantish superficiality to these pastoral approaches. So that's, uh, and only, I only mentioned that not to drag you into my hobby horse, but to, you know, because viewers sometimes think I'm this very big anti-Francis guy and I'm not, uh, I'm not pro-Francis. I'm not anti-Francis. I just find the whole thing to be a big, let down after the dream team of people like Benedict and John Paul. Anyway, so back to John Paul, which is, okay, we got Gaudium at Spes, 22, and uh, Henry de Lubach, his theology looms large in Gaudium at Spes, 22. De Lubach's fantastic book, The Drama of Atheist Humanism, you can get it from Ignatius Press, it's still in print, very important in my own thinking. De Lubach's point is that modern that the church in dialoguing with the modern world does not should not reject humanism it should show how christianity gives us the deeper humanism the better anthropology and that is really at the source of gaudium et spes 22 all right that the church is asserting that in christ we have a deeper and better anthropology therefore it is not an accident that pope john paul ii's very first encyclical was an encyclical on Christological theological anthropology called Redemptor Hominis. And he proposed, therefore, Christ as the answer to the great humanistic crisis of our time in, in that encyclical. In that regard, I think he, he sort of set the tone and said, my pontificate is going to be about retrieving Vatican II along the lines of this Christological theological anthropology for the sake of the whole world. What do you think of my, yeah, of it, my spin? No, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't take it as a spin as much as, as I recall, somewhere in, in his writings, he said that the Lubach wrote to him or, or convicted him of precisely that, that the, the yeah. problem of our age was this pulverization of the person. I mean, he said, I mean, John Paul acknowledges that the contents of Redemptor Holmanis had already been written, written. Uh, that's also what makes the two of them a dream team, right? They lived during the hor both of them lived during the horrors of World War II, obviously for John Paul and Poland, right? I mean, you know, his friends, you know, families, neighbors that he knew, knew right? Jewish friends and neighbors being carted off to the, the death chambers, right? I mean, it, it, it affected him in a very deep and profound way. And then, you know, when liberated at, from the Nazis having to live, live under, under communism. And so in response to that false humanism, that drama of atheist humanism, he gives us the, this, you know, this luminous Christian humanism. Um, and, and it's it's really, I mean, that's the beauty of Redemptor Hominis. It's all, all the other encyclicals, all the other thought just really kind of, you know, uh, goes forth from it. It emanates from it. In fact, in Redemptor Hominis, there's that, it's one of the probably more frequently quoted lines, right? That man, man cannot live without love, right? He, he, you know, basically he's, he's alienated if he cannot, you know, uh, understand it. And so, I mean, it's, it's significant, right? Both of them, John Paul and Benedict, hone in on that same that same theme of what what love is. And for both, it's at the end of the day, Eucharistic, right? Jesus says, This is my body given up for you. Whereas the secular humanism says, No, nope, this is my body. Puto. I will do with it what I want, what I want, with yeah. whom I want. Right? The, the transgender ideology is just extending, you know, this materialist view further, really. I mean, you just that's what you that's what you get when you say, no, this is my body. This is, you know, this is my blood. It, it removes that notion of of self gift, right? And love and responsibility, right? The opposite of love is use. And that's what we say we see playing out. So. Absolutely. And uh, I think that's very important, that line from Redemptor Holiness about, you know, 
you really don't know what it means to be human until you love and uh, and love to the end love love gratuitously love largely <laughs> love everyone yep. uh and and yep. you will find how expansive it is now let's but let's come back then to joseph ratzinger i mean uh ratzinger too you know suffered the horrors of world war ii but strangely from within germany and so even though he experienced the destructive aftermath in germany of, of the war in some ways, since his family was anti-Nazi, uh, his father was very anti-Nazi, the Ratzingers sort of existed below the war, below the radar, whereas someone like a John Paul, I mean, de Lubach fought in the resistance. I mean, he I mean, worked, not fought, but worked in the resistance in France, put himself in peril. John Paul II was in Poland and suffered, you know, directly under the Nazis and then later under the Soviets. So it's interesting, yeah, the young Joseph Ratzinger, though, in Nazi Germany, didn't really suffer through the horrors of it the way I think John Paul and de Lubach did. No, but yet, you know, I think one of the most beautiful speeches, I, I reread it recently, is the speech that Benedict gave at Auschwitz, you know, where he yeah at, he dares to ask the question, where was, was God? In fact, I mean, for anyone you know, going through suffering, right? I mean, yes, read... John Paul Salvi Salvivici Dolores, but go back to that speech at the Benedict gave in Auschwitz. It's a very, very powerful one. I mean, a very brave, very, very powerful. I think, though, I'm, I don't mean to imply that Ratzinger was unaffected by the war, but but I think Ratzinger was more affected by the war on an intellectual level and in his soul as a German. I think he was quite devastated internally as a German to understand what his fellow countrymen had done. Uh, and and it also intellectually then raised the, the specter of the problem of horrific evil on, on just monumental scale. And, and in, you know, it, this is not to say, obviously, that culture was not at the forefront of John Paul's mind, because it was, right? In fact, I, I'm almost certain that the Pontifical Council for Culture was established under John Paul's watch, but whereas person was the, the central project of, of John Paul, I mean, besides liturgy, culture was very much at the, the forefront of, of Ratzinger's mind. Because let's, I mean, you know, yeah, the yeah. German culture, I mean, I mean, think of German culture, I mean, all the philosophers and artists and musicians that it gave us, right, this highly developed culture interested in truth and beauty. And yet, right, the uh, this horrific nightmare you know unfolds there how is it possible that a culture that's supposed to produce all these so-called intellectuals yeah. and not just so-called but real intellectuals and artisans right produces this horror right this is a fundamental it's an important important question to be raised and, and so yes he didn't suffer in yeah. that way Wojtyla did but I, I think he certainly suffered what really all Germans of you know, of all good Germans, you know, suffer, right? They still kind oh, of, you know, yeah, they still do. I mean, uh, they still do. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's all true by way of sort of background as well to Gaudium at best. We need to remember that all yeah. of the council fathers, all of them had lived through the era of World War II. And, you know, I didn't live through the World War II era, but I, my grandparents did. And, uh, I remember speaking with them and it was horrifying and and my grandfather fought in world war ii and and i think therefore i think it accounts for some of the desire on the part of the council fathers to be more open to the currents and movements of liberal western democracy and the concept of human rights and the charter of human rights you know put out by the united nations the declaration on human rights i think there was just this feeling of this must be done. We must make peace with these people because otherwise what awaits us are Soviets or Nazis and so on. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, Benedict Ratzinger chose the name Benedict. We always, we tend to focus on, you know, St. Benedict, the evangelization of Europe and all that is true. All that obviously, you know, given his interest in, in, in liturgy, but also he, you know, Benedict the Fifteenth, right? The the, you know, uh, he's interested in peace, right? I mean, he want, you know, wants to avoid any any kind of, you know, war, right? And 
Yes, yeah. we have the modern the modern yeah. state has not been very very favorable to to the church on varying fronts. You know? No, it hasn't. I mean, I just ask people to remember, I mean, the great traumatic event of our time, 9-11, was 23 years ago now, whereas when the Second Vatican Council okay. opened, it was a mere 17 years after the end of World War II uh, and at the height of the Cold War and the nuclear annihilation that both sides were threatening each other with. So there was a real existential fear that the world was going to destroy itself. And that is why I, I, I do think that is somewhat of what accounts for an overly optimistic view of liberal, the values of liberal Western democracy. And, and I think that accounts for it. But anyway, uh, let's get back. The, I mean, no, that, no, that, go ahead. Go ahead. That, that, yeah, that, you know, like Chantisi Musanus, right? I mean, we, you know, people want to get into the debates about the implicate, implications for economics. And I certainly understand that. But the thing that strikes me is, of course, you know, his focus on the anthropology there, right? He, that, you know, John yeah. Paul, once again, doubles down in Chantis Musanus and says, look, the, the fundamental question, the fundamental issue here, right? The problem with communism, it, it's an error in on the level of anthropology, right? But the same thing is true with respect to the you know, consumerist mentality, once again, right? It is also an anthropological issue right it you know it's not the economy stupid it's the human person stupid that's right <laughs> the famous line from james carville bill clinton's yes. campaign director it's it's the economy yes. stupid all right no it's it's the anthropology stupid and i think let's let's get back to that because my my friend father robert imbelli who was a seminarian in rome while the council was going on so if he's listening hello father imbelli uh, he's written some beautiful things on the council, especially Dei Verbum. Uh, but he of late has said, you know, in various ways, in publication and in private, that the key crisis of our time in the church and in the world is anthropology. And, and I think this is the, the thread that links together the 20th century with our own time, the thread that links together Vatican II, Communio Theology, Ratzinger, John Paul II, and the ongoing crisis of our own time. This open, burning question, as my friend Mark Stallman always asks, what it, the, the modern world is pressing upon us the question, what is a human being? Hmm. So, yeah, and I think of, uh, you know, the, the late Father Norris Clark, um, yes, the Jesuit at Fordham, you know, he you know, highlighting the what he calls what the uh, creative retrieval of the metaphysics of Saint Thomas, but he says to be is to be in relation. Relation. I, you know, I think that yes, that is the key, right? I mean, the human person we don't exist as the these you know, autonomous individuals, but I you know we're not called to just you know be alone together because that's the current problem with the technocracy right we are and that phrase comes from sherry turkle at mit we're alone together you walk into a coffee shop a starbucks it's set for eight ten people and but every, no one's talking to each other they're all alone together right to father and belly's point that we what we've got here is an anthropological issue right we are because look, this all this technology is supposed to do all these great things for us, and it has, right? You can zoom with, with people as we are now, right? And nationally, internationally, talking to family members. But yet, right, twenty twenty three, what's the major pan epidemic concern of the Surgeon General? Loneliness, right? The the technocracy hasn't, yeah. you know, ha it's not able to address loneliness, and that's and the isolation. So, but once again, it's an anthropological issue to be is to be in relation. Um, and Norris Clark is one of those Thomists, and it was controversial, who believed, and along with David L. Schindler, who I just did a show on, that relationality should be one of the transcendental properties of being. Uh, and this was, you know, a strict Thomas was saying, no, the transcendental properties of being are the one, the true, and the good. Uh, so, so those who don't know, I mean, what, what Thomas would say is that anything insofar as it is, insofar as it exists. One of the things that all existing things share is, you know, the, the oneness, an internal self and an, a self identity, truth and goodness. And Norris Clark and some other Thomas wanted to add 
relationality as one of the constitutive properties of everything that exists, that everything that exists exists in relation to something else. Is Am I getting Norris Clark right, Roland? Is that right? Yeah, no, I think so. I was distracted because I was one, I was thinking, I wonder if Larry could help me understand that the never ending debates between Schindler and Clark, they were these obscure, you know, are, uh, to me, they were obscure, right? We were going into the weeds on essay and being and that. Yeah. You know, I yeah. Mean, maybe, maybe if I re maybe if I revisited them now. Well, that's why I'm asking time, you, you know. I, you met you brought up Norris Clark and, and it's not unrelated to Ratzinger and JP, too, because it's all part of their thinking as well. This, you know, that we only know what it means to be human being when we love uh, and and Christ was the man pro nobis for us. And he was the relational person. So and, and all these modern Trinitarian theologies are deeply relational in their understanding of the Trinitarian person. So it's not a really. So that's why I asked you about Clark, because. Maybe I'm remembering this wrong. Maybe it was Schindler that was arguing for relationality being a transcendental property of being. And maybe Norris Clark said, well, relationality is important, but it's not a transcendental property. Of being." So I'd have to revisit that whole debate. Yeah. Along but with to you. the point, as oh, far I can't, as yes. I'm sorry, Roland, I cannot enlighten you there, obviously. So but, but the notion of pronobis, it it plays itself out repeatedly in. And Ratzinger's thought, right? We are to yeah. enter into that living for pro, right? He calls it even pro existence, right? I mean, Christ is the you know the paradigm, right? Or I guess as Balthazar would put it, the Gestalt, right? Of 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 the human person. We're called to enter into that existing for another, uh, and it seems like such a simple point, but yet very profound. I mean, that's precisely what Saint Paul means when he says, "It's not I who lives." But Christ who lives in me, I am called to enter into that dynamic of self-giving love, right? His love is meant to be yeah. his life, his love is meant to become mine, right? And you know, and they were they were consistent in I mean, both of them in in pushing that th those themes in varying ways. Oh yeah, big time. And uh, by the way, just so our, I, I before I forget, let's plug your book. What's the name of your book? A Living Sacrifice, Liturgy and Eschatology in Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, I mean, that yeah. itself, right? In Rome, Romans 12, 1, right? St. Paul exhorts us to make of our bodies a living yes. sacrifice. In spirit, pro in nobis, spirit to live pro nobis. Yeah. That's what yeah. made me think of it. Yeah. And in fact, Rat, you know, Ratzinger says that in, in the spirit of liturgy, that's the essential form of worship, right? The logike latre, right? To worship according to the logos how does the logos worship well or what does that mean ultimately the the pronobis right i mean to yeah. the, you know this i mean at the heart of it is sacrifice but sacrifice isn't about destruction it's about love right you know rats finger rights in in spirit of the liturgy yeah, absolutely yeah that is that is i loved your book that is good stuff and i recommend everybody run out and buy it so because it's good but let's go <laughs> i want to come back to rod singer now uh one of the caricatures of, of Joseph Ratzinger, and this goes to his role in what he did with John Paul II. One of the caricatures is, well, when he, right before the council and during the council, he was a liberal uh, and was a progressive, whatever those terms mean. You know, he was, he was all in favor of changing the church more in the direction of Rahner and Skilovics and those guys. All right. And, and then later, like in the late sixties, after the student riots in, in Europe, and then what he saw was going down in the church. And then he had buyer's remorse and realized, oh, no, this is all wrong. And he took a wildly conservative swing and became the Panzer Cardinal, swinging his axe willy nilly, putting theologians down in the name of John Paul's autocratic and narrow minded reactionary vision of Catholicism. That was a grand betrayal of the reforms of the council. You know the narrative, Roland. What's wrong with that? I know, I, 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 I know the narrative. Well, in Ratzinger's own words, it's not, you know, he, he says, look, I'm not the one who changed. They, meaning Kuhn, Rahner, they're yeah. the ones that changed, right? I mean, the, all those who would eventually form, as we know how the story goes, right? You know, you say concilium, I say communium, right? And, and that's where, you know, and in fact, I think it was Father, Father Toomey, on you know, when we had that, he did that conversation with him. He said that that's yeah. kind of a myth. Like he did not. It wasn't a result of this this 1968 moment. It wasn't. Uh, I mean, he's really he's been consistent. Are, are there particular positions that 
have changed. Sure. In fact, there, you know, I was thinking of the retract, you know, retraction on the, uh, you know, divorce remarriage question with respect to Holy Communion. There was this famous 1972 essay, right, where seemingly for pastoral reasons, he was he was favoring, you know, this opinion. But then when his collected works were were published, you know, he issues a, a retraction. That is, it's very Augustinian of him, right? Just kind of going back, looking yeah. over, you know, all of my collected works. Here are some things that that would change. That's an honest theologian. But for the most part, he's consistent. In fact, I think, uh, of course, her first name escapes me. I think she was at Harvard, Schusler Fiorenza. You know, Elizabeth, she was a, Elizabeth she, Schusler. You know, yeah, she was a she was a student of of Ratzinger's, right? She, she studied under him. In fact, I think she wrote an essay about how. It's uh, it's a false narrative. He he's he's actually been very consistent, yes. you know. And that's the other thing. If you look at his just his doctoral students, there are some people whom people would label as conservative, as liberal. There are you know Catholics, there are Orthodox, you know, etc. I mean, the key thing is he was dialogical. He was willing to engage in conversation with with everyone. Uh, I mean, his great wow. gift was 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 listening. He would. You know, he would never, you know, from what I understand, his doctoral seminars, he would just let everybody speak and then he would go last and he would basically summarize everything that everybody else said and sometimes even better and even weaknesses in people's arguments. He would kind of, you know, either yeah, unlike, up or oh, say how you kind of reformulate them, you know, was it? I but think it was, really, you know. I read Louis yeah, Bouillet's, uh, reading Louis Bouillet's memoirs, and I think it was there where Bouillet points out that if let's con compare and contrast the graduate school seminars run by Rahner and those run by Ratzinger. When Ratzinger, like you said, Ratzinger seminars, everybody would speak. Everybody got to you know speak their mind and then Ratzinger would sit back. And then at the end, he would give his own views on things very graciously and charitably and summarize where he thought the question resided. And always with his brilliant, concise and incisive view on that. Whereas Rahner and all his graduate seminars would proceed to lecture for an hour and not let anybody else speak and then would get to the end and the great Herr Vater Doctor Professor would just walk out of the room without even entertaining yep. questions. And then there yeah, was a da, da, famous... Das ist genug, you know. <laughs> das ist genug. Oh, um, auf Wiedersehen. And out, out he would go. Sure. There was a famous story too in Bouillet's memoirs where uh, Bouillet and Ratzinger were sitting in on some committee, some Vatican II committee, and Rahner was pontificating at this committee on about something. And apparently Ratzinger leaned over to Bouillet and whispered, oh, great, another monologue on dialogue. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in other words, this was not a, you know, a guy who was wildly in favor of this you know, this open ended worldliness in the, you know, and these hackneyed terms, conservative, liberal, whatever, or traditionalist, what it boils down to is this, the conservative, the, the very, very traditionalist types, the Ottaviani types, they had a vision of the church that was still largely dialectical vis-a-vis -vis the world. It was Catholicism contra mundum. It, it was Catholicism against the world. And it was just its role to preach the truth and condemn error and go along. It was very dialectical, oppositional. On the other hand, you had the Ranarian wing and the, the Skilabexian wing that was very Catholicism pro mundum, okay? Catholicism in favor of the world. Let's just go out to the world. Let's open our doors to the world. Let's become like the world, uh, like a chameleon. And then you had the race or small thinkers like Ratzinger. And their attitude was, yes, we need to be open to the world, but critically, we need to appropriate the spoils of Egypt. Therefore, the race source movement was not dialectical, nor was it simply monistic in, in embracing the world. It was analogical. It wanted to embrace those overlapping areas of interest between the modern world and the church, but also then to critique those areas of falsehood. Uh, so that's how I would characterize where Ratzinger fit in and why when he founded Comunio with Balthazar and Dulubak, it was not some sudden turn to the right. It was simply his analogical approach to, to the question of how do we address the world? Yeah. And well, now, what do you make you know, of this distinction that Cardinal Dulles speaks of that 
it was a, a basically a battle of different camps. On the one hand, you have the the Thomists, and the other on the other hand, the the Augustinians, and they were the ones battling over you know the meaning. And he might put the you know Octaviani in the so called Thomist camp, and then the you know to borrow from Father Ralph w Wiltkin, right? The Rhine that represents some of these so called uh, Augustinians. I mean, do you, do you do you buy that narrative? Do you think no. it was that simple? Do you think no? Because I actually think if you look at Rahner, for example, and then then I want to know what you think. I'm interviewing you, doggone it, not you, me. All right. I don't want to be. This isn't the Larry Chap hour. But still, here's my take. If you read Rahner and Skillebex, and these, these guys are still very Thomistic. What I, th I think you saw in the tradi traditionalist, you know, the, like, let's be against the world. Let's fortress Catholicism, that mentality. They were hyper Thomistic in a very neo-scholastic way. I think, though, that in their own way, the progressives who wanted a much more accommodating posture towards the modern world were still Thomas. I just think they were very progressive Thomas. Uh, and, and I think the Augustinian element comes in with people like <clears throat> to, to a name, Ratzinger and uh, even to a certain extent, De Lubach. People like Wojtyla. Wojtyla was that, and I want you to talk on this eventually. He was that out of that strange school of Thomism called Lublin Thomism, all right, uh, that was neither Augustinian nor straight up Thomist. But anyway, I think it is a little more complex than, than that scenario that was put forward by you there. Who was it? Yeah, you were well, the, uh, Card Cardinal Dulles. You know? Oh, yeah, and Cardinal this Dulles, is yeah. Yeah, because you know Massimo Fagioli, right? he's from the huh. that Bologna school. Bologna school, some might say Bologna, uh, but he, maximum you know, he beans. Forth, you know, mac, maximum beans. Massimo Fagioli, um, you know, he'll draw upon that narrative out, out of Dulles, and I, I, I can't remember yeah. where, where it is. I did find the essay, but I still, I, I think it over, oversimplifies it. I mean, part of the issue is, I mean, what do we mean by Thomas, right? I mean. Many, as we all know, right? I mean, you you know, transcendental Thomas versus existential Thomas versus the Thomas of the strict observance, or you know, there's a variety yeah. of of Thomisms out there, and Lublin Thomism. Would someone say, "Well, this is a subset <clears throat> of existentialist Thomas," right? Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I mean, so it's, the, it's complicated. Uh, August, yeah. yeah, Augustinians like Ratzinger had a stronger sense of the role of the libido dominandi in the world and in the church. Whereas I, uh, some of the more progressive Thomas, I mean, Tracy Rowland has identified 17 different versions of Thomism in the 20th century. So, yeah, it's, it's a little difficult to say, oh, the Thomas that, I, you know, I love Avery. I love Avery Dulles. I thought he was uh, really good at what he did. However, I don't think he was a brilliant theologian. I really don't. I think what Dulles was very do, gifted do you take at. Him, do you think he was more? Do you think he was more of a historian then? Is that yeah, how, and and you? also a taxonomist. In other words, he engaged okay. in what some have called, and I love the term uh, theography. Okay, he okay. was a theographer, uh, in the sense that he was very good at cataloging schools of thought, and categorizing them, and then analyzing various thinkers to see where they fit into those historical taxonomies. Now, the, the, the beauty of that is it allows us, it gives us context. It, everything's not just a cacophony. People do fit into schools of thought. Sometimes these terms really are accurately descriptive and not simply distorting. On the other hand, there is a tendency to simply try to fit everything within those taxonomies, within those categories. And, and I think then, then you have a danger. Uh, and yeah, I, I benefited greatly from reading Dulles. And, so, and I'm not saying that his analysis here is completely wrong, but there is this problem of oversimplification in much of what Dulles did. And, and I think here we, we also have a case of it. Hmm. That's my yeah, take. And speaking of that. I, yeah. P Tracy Rowland, that, that book, I, you know, I commend it. I think now I'm forgetting what it's called. Something Catholic theology. It's just called Catholic, Catholic theology. theology. Is That's it just all called, it's called theology. Yeah, yeah, that is a great book for any undergrad or graduate student to just get a get the lay of the land, right? The chapter on liberation yeah. theology, communio theology. Uh, I mean, you know, I can't you know, recommend it more highly. I think my wife has used it in some of her uh, online courses as well. It's not a very big book at all. It's very manageable, and it simplifies things without being simplistic. 
It's a really yeah. great introduction to the history of 20th century theology and what all of these debates that you and I are talking about right now, what their pedigree is. So rather than reading Avery Dulles, I would have read pe have people read. Um, well, if you can read both, that's even better. But if you have limited time and you want to choose Avery Dulles or Tracy Rowland, I would choose Tracy Rowland seven times a week and twice on Sunday. Uh, I, I think Although so. I, I will say with respect to Dulles, his his book on it's entitled The Splendor of Faith. It's just a good synthesis. glorious a book. Very, oh, yeah, Roland, I am so glad of, you have called me Paul out. Theology, you know? Yeah, you know, that is, that a, is great a great synthesis, book. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is. You know, because he no. dives into he dives into what we teach was interventions. He really does. He covers it all there. You know, not just the. No, he really does. I forgot about that book. Yeah, I have got yeah. it's been a long time since I read that book. But anyway, in fact, I have a I have I have a signed signed copy of it from him. He uh, and he smiled and then he told me, you know, that people say that this is when I took a right turn, you know, but and then once again, right, one of these people who people who say they changed, but he, he maintains otherwise, you know. But oh, I think he did change. You read his book from his books, the models of the church, models of revelation, which were written in the I've not read my I didn't I've read some of models of. of yeah, I, so. once again, it, it's it's kind of this theography sort of thing. It's like no, here are, no. in other words, little book on ecclesiology, models of the church. OK, here's X, you know, W, X, Y, Z. Here are four models that people have talked about for the church, four schools of thought. And this guy does this, this guy does this guy, does, you know, and Dulles gives the impression in that book. Well, that each one of these models is legitimate. And yet some of them are not. That's that's the problem. Oh, uh, this, this is true, right? He'll, yeah. So he he offers the summary, but he never, you know, gives the final analysis. Well, who's right? Right. Who is? Yeah. You know, yeah. I go, wait a minute. You just, I remember reading it thinking, well, well, wait, 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 this is a cliffhanger. Which one of these is better? <laughs> you know, and you know, yeah, <laughs> holy cow. OK, so anyway, this isn't a show, but Avery Dulles. Let's get back to Rotzinger and John Paul, <laughs> shall we? We return sure. to our heroes. OK, I want to now focus on. OK, we, we've dispensed. This was all a, a sort of long discussion and a good one, I think, on the falseness of that narrative of Rod Singer shifting from being like this uber progressive. You know, one of the and the, I want to add to this one last thing. I think one of the reasons why modern day traditionalists believe that Rod Singer was a crypto modernist is I think and, and even John Paul is I don't think they have a deep enough appreciation for the analogical approach to the world that communal theology has rather than the dialectical approach. Traditionalists prefer the scorched earth dialectical no to the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the communal thinkers have a yes and a no. I think more of a Catholic both and. and now that's a bit of a caricature, but I think it's true. But anyway, so there's that narrative. What do you think then uh, when Ratzinger was the head of the DDF, the CDF. What was his role then in policing errant theological views? Because in other words, what I'm trying to do here is to dispel false opinions, false caricatures of Ratzinger. And the one of the characters, of course, Panzer Cardinal, he was putting down theologians left and right, Hans Kung, Leonardo Boff. What do you think of that narrative? Yeah, I think he... You know the word I used earlier was uh, authentically dialogical, right? I, you know, I think he, you know, he called in these errant theologians, maybe about a particular work in question, and he, you know, basically the the seminar continued, right? I mean, it was a extension in the sense that he allowed these people to discuss their works, right, and raise and raise questions, and in some instances. I mean, I you know the example that comes to mind, um, you know, with respect to think of liberation theology, uh, yes. you know, Gutierrez, right? I mean, Gutierrez, I think, really took to heart that that dialogue, um, and you know, he he changed his views. In fact, and some people, I mean, people will they'll probably scorch earth us in the comments when they look at Larry and and Roland, you know, speaking yeah. positively about about liberation theology, but I mean. They should look at the co-authored book between Gutierrez and Cardinal Mueller. Mueller. I mean that you know there is a you know there there's some there's good cholesterol uh, liberation theology. In fact, <laughs> Mueller, Mueller, you know Mueller in that book. What's the good cholesterol? About, HDL. Yeah. It's, this is an <laughs> HDL theology. Yeah. 
but, but he makes that comment that always, you know, because he never says who fits under these, but he said there were basically two streams of liberation theology. One that was influenced by de Lubach, and then once again, the other one by, by Rahner. And I think, you know, we could safely say, you know, that someone like uh, Gutierrez, right, influenced by de Lubach, uh, and maybe the Boffs, not so much, right? Because that, that, that same interaction with with Ratzinger didn't didn't play out as as well, um, you know. But I think yeah. that was his 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 role was to you know, and that's why he gets that caricature, right? Panzer Cardinal because he had to be the heavy. He had to be the one to, you know, meet with these people, and I'm sure it it weighed weighed on him. I mean, I you know, there, you know, three times he tried to step down from the position of head of the. Yeah, at CDF. Who who would want such a position? Um, yeah. You know, in fact, I think at one point he wanted a job working at the Vatican Library. He would have been. Yeah, that's right. Would have been great. He, he would have been great at that. You know, the bookish Rotzinger just wanted yeah, to. He was always spend I mean, he his was days. The, yeah. The reluctant, yeah, the reluctant pontiff. I mean, when yeah, he, he yeah I mean, he was. You know, you know, reading Peter Seewald's uh, account, right? I mean, you know, the, that image, right? At the, you know, he said as it's becoming clear in the conclave, the the. You know, things were being cast his way, you know, liken it to like a guillotine cutting off his cutting off his head. And he was always the shy, humble, gentle professor. Right. He was not, you know, made for the stage. But yet, as soon as he got in the Lotia, he, 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 he lit up. Right. Now, his speeches. Right. They were very intellectual, but they had great depth. I mean, those September speeches. Right. Whether we're talking about Regensburg or, you know, um, in front of the. Um, you know, in, in Germany, in the Bundestag, I mean, these are great speeches. Um, you know, I, I think his, so. his, you know, his speeches and his homilies, I think that's where, where the gold is that we need to, to mine. Right? I mean, we've, we've been looking yeah. at a lot of his theological writings, but I think the speeches, especially the homilies, in fact, Cardinal DiNardo, my ordinary, he, he makes the argument, uh, or he's at least made the statement, I should say, that he he thinks that Benedict is the best homilist since Augustine. Now, now Cardinal Donardo is a patristics person, so that but that says a lot, I think. You know, a better that. homilist than Newman. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So to go back to the liberation theology guys, because I think they're they're always, I mean, Hans Kung is also always brought up, but you know, Hans Kung deserved what he got. <laughs> I once had a conversation with Cardinal Walter Casper in a limousine, which happened to be, you know, sharing a limousine to the airport. And it was right before John Paul had died. <clears throat> and so we were discussing the legacy of John Paul. And I said to Walter Casper, Cardinal Casper, I said, tell me, you know, Hans Kung is yes, yes, I know Hans Kung. And I said, uh, well, what is your opinion of Hans Kung? He goes, well, Hans Kung was better before he became Hans Kung. <laughs> in other words, you know, he became a kind of bigger than life caricature of himself and began to live out the role of the grand provocateur, the Don Quixote tilting at the grand papal windmill, you know, and he really believed that narrative about himself. And I think Leonardo de Boff fell into a similar thing. There, there was a hubris there that did not leave them open to correction. And they had an inbuilt chip on their shoulder towards Roman authority. Balthazar wrote about this at the time in, in a famous essay called the anti-Romasha effect, meaning the, the anti-Roman sentiment is what has led to some of So it's in other words, it's not Ratzinger who was at fault here, but the arrogance of people like a, a Boff or a Kung unwilling to enter into dialogue, whereas Gutierrez went to Rome, had a great dialogue with Ratzinger, said, OK, yeah, he's right about this and he's wrong about that. And I'm going to go do this, you know, and there he oh. is, you know, with a book by Mueller. Anyway, well, I'm prattling on again. You you bring out the worst <laughs> in me and my loquaciousness, Roland, because I think it's we we think alike. But I, I yeah. think you're right. I think <clears throat> that he, he remained a man of, of dialogue to the end. Um, and, and both and both of them. Right. I mean, uh, you know, as far as a dream team, it's a reminder to us, you know, as I mean, those who, who serve the church, you know, either as as theologians or whatever capacity as as leaders that need to always be humble before the truth. I mean, I mean, that's neither one of them ever lost sight of that. You know, I always tell people, look, when he when Benedict was a priest, they said his you know, the then father Ratz, Ratzinger, 
had standing room only at his children's masses. I think that tells you what you need to know about the yes. man, right? You know? Yes. You can comment on this maybe better than I can. One of the, th the young rock singers simply wanted to spend his career like Rahner spent his and Balthazar spent his and Guardini spent his and, you know, basically like in Balthazar's case, being a, a spiritual director and university chaplain, but in Rahner and Bouillet and Guardini and De Lubac, they, they, they were lecturers. And so that's why and what people tend to forget is that in Europe at that time, especially in Germany, if you became a famous theology lecturer, you had enormous influence in the culture. You know? Yeah. yeah. And 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 people would flock. That's what made me think of it when you just said it. People would flock to these lectures like theologians were miniature rock stars almost in, in the Germany. Well, yeah, that time. yeah. I mean, they say, you know, the introduction to Christianity, which is essentially the, a text of his of these lectures. Somebody had recorded them and then, you know, yeah. he approved the the transcripts. I mean, my understanding is standing room only, even with like the, the av average show. Right? People just hung on to his words. He was a rock star, but it never consumed him. It never got to his it never got to his head. Right. That's the great challenge. Right. To be to be humble before the truth. I mean, uh, with no disrespect to the present pontiff, right? But the the false narrative the media likes to play up is Pope Francis is very humble, unlike his predecessor. But that's just not the case. Right? I mean, Pope oh, Francis, I know. I mean, uh, so... you know, Benedict, Benedict Ratzinger was very humble. In fact, I remember he caused a scandal because he wanted to bring all his old ratty furniture from his apartment, his bookshelves, his desk to the papal apartment. They said, "Oh, I mean, what, what is all that stuff?" And for him, it was like, "No, this is." The furniture I've carted around from Germany, and I'm going to continue to to bring it with me. In fact, he, he you know, when he was named Pope, he went around, uh, you know, to the different apartments of these cardinals, not to tell the cardinals goodbye, but to tell the staff, to tell the domestic servants of these varying cardinals that he was leaving, that he was no longer going to be their neighbor, and thanking them, right? But that th yeah. that shows you his that his his great humility, you know. Oh yeah, I think nothing. Nothing makes me angrier than to read in the popular media. And I guess it's understandable. It's popular media. They play in the sandbox of these stereotypes. And they're all in the popular media, especially the secular media. They're all captivated by the modern, secular, liberal, Western narrative of things. Uh, it, nothing makes me. Yeah, but yet, yeah, but yet, you know, that yet the, then Cardinal you know, Ratzinger on his way to work. I mean, you know, all the time people would say, hey, excuse me, sir, father. Cardinal, they don't know who he is. Would you mind taking our photo? And he stopped. <laughs> he would gladly, gladly yeah. oblige them. You know, there, there yeah. he was, the, the head of the CDF, future pontiff, you know, taking taking their photo. You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. No... But the narrative we get instead is the kind and avuncular and gentle and grandfatherly Pope Francis who wants to stay in this humble hotel versus the imperious Panzer Cardinal, autocratic, not humble. Joseph Ratzinger, yeah, and yeah, these and then, caricatures yeah, are and, hideous. And this isn't to criticize yeah, Pope Francis; it's to criticize the caricature. It's not no, fair to Pope Francis I... either to portray him as just this benevolent, almost senile uncle in the sky, you know, in Rome. Uh, you know, the, the benevolent uncle on the Tiber. That's not because yeah. he's number one. He's he's tough as nails, Pope Francis. He's tough as nails. He's anything but avuncular or benevent, benevolent, according to the people that actually work in Rome. Uh, okay, so there. So that's this is where these caricatures really break down. Ratzinger really was humble, and I'm not entirely convinced of the humbleness of the current occupant of the chair of Peter. Uh, but anyway, once again, I don't want to drag you into those debates. I do want to before we get out of here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger's, and we've been focusing on Ratzinger more than JP, too, because, I mean, you did your work on him. And so much more, I think, is known about John Paul. At least I, I think so. But anyway, why do you think Benedict resigned? You know, I, I really, you know, I'm just convinced by the narrative that he saw he took an honest assessment of his health. And said he didn't have the stamina. We, we have to remember that he was at John Paul's, you know, was always his his right hand man. They had their their weekly meetings, you know. If I understand, they 
They spoke to one another in German. But then at, at some point, he saw, you know, what's sometimes called John Paul's last encyclical, right, by by George Weigel, that the suffering that he went as, you know, the Parkinson's was taking yeah. over. And then, you know, at the end of the day, right, I mean, was, I mean, how much was John Paul actually at the helm as, as pontiff and so maybe he saw that he didn't and he didn't want that but it's strange right because he you know benedict was the pope emeritus longer than he was than he was pope uh, i mean i think he lived you know longer than maybe he maybe he thought um but he entered into what you know he he really did enter into that his namesake, right? He became, lived a Benedictine life towards the end there, that that enclosure. Uh, actually, one of the things I'm excited to see, I, I've heard that they're going to publish the homilies that he yes. gave, you know. I mean, th those will be, you know, because uh, that was the thing. He was still prep. He was still prepping homilies. He didn't cease to be a pastor, a shepherd, even for that small household. Um, yeah, and, you know, I think, you know, too, people tend to forget how deeply, I think, uh, personally, I think, Joseph Ratzinger is a saint in heaven as we speak. I think he's a saint. And uh, I think his saintliness was very active in this life. And therefore, one of the things that we need to take seriously as very important is when he said that in my retirement, I'll, I will spend my time in prayer. Uh, yeah. the, the role, I think he viewed the active ministry, and he makes this distinction when he resigns. I'm resigning the active ministry. Of, you know, I'm giving up the, the the Munera of being the Bishop of Rome in the active ministry. But he retained the white cassock, and he retained the title Holy Father, and he retained a certain emeritus, Papa Emeritus. But in this case, I think it was going to be a, a papacy of silent prayer for the sake of the church, which I think he thought would be far more efficacious than any activist thing that he would be doing. What do you think? Do you like, do you like my analysis there? Is, do you think that's something? No, I, no I, I do. I, I mean, at some point, right, the rumors really start flying when he prayed in front of the tomb of St. Saint, Saint Celestine, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he would, you know, St. Celestine, right, the last pope, pope to resign from the office. Remember, Dante puts uh, Celestine in one of the circles of hell, in part because, uh, because of Boniface who came after him, right, was... Uh, such a terror right but you can't judge you know a previous pontiff based on a a present pontiff right that doesn't apply not not merely to celestine oh, yeah. but, even, but, but 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 even now um but that i think also is you know his willingness to resign and i've written about this i think it's a sign of his humility it takes a lot of courage to to say you know in the in the words of the philosopher the philosopher uh, kenny rogers right you got to know when to hold them and when when to fold them, uh, and so yeah. he he, yeah. he went out gracefully and and chose the better part, right? Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and and prays, right? For him, right, the theology on on the knees, right, is is critical. That Marian, you know, I guess another way we could look at it is yes, he surrenders the the Petrine dimension of the church, but very much leans into the Marian aspect, right? The uh, oh, so true. You know, we, and we yeah. tend to focus so much as Americans on the utilitarian, the efficient, that which works and so on. We tend to forget that in God's economy of salvation and the economy of grace, what is outward and, appar and apparently more important is not as important as the prayer of the inward soul. I was just reading the story of a very saintly priest who on his deathbed said that in prayer, what had come to him was that simple acts of kindness kindness have pre have prevented wars and it, you know, and you think well in the in the spiritual realm the spiritual laws that pertain in the spiritual realm the silent prayer or the, or just the minis most minuscule act of kindness towards another human being has ripple effects cosmically that we just don't even begin to realize hmm. so no, I, think, I mean you and you think you think of you think of Therese of Lisieux, right? I mean patroness yeah. of missionaries, Missionary. but yet never, you know, that, that doesn't leave the leave the Carmel, right? Somehow she's the equivalent of of Saint Francis Xavier. And so Benedict's missionary work to evangelize the West didn't cease, you know, to your point, right? I mean, he enters into that enclosure and frankly, you know, in that silent prayer was more effective, right? Because what people always forget. Is remember he commissioned those three cardinals to look at the corruption 
you know, within the the state of of the church. And frankly, the only yeah. people that know what's in the contents of that that book are those three cardinals who did that study, Benedict, and then Pope Francis, because it was to be entrusted to his successor, right? Because he wanted to look at well, well yeah. how bad is how bad are things, you know, yeah. within within the church. That was after his own personal secretary leaked many of his private letters and so mm -hmm. on too you know the, the vatty leaks uh scandal where benedict must have felt enormously betrayed and a sense of complete vulnerability i can't even control the correspondence from my own apartment how can i control the church and so that must have weighed on him well i'm gonna but, but and, 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 and the, yeah they said they said that was that they said that was ratzinger's Ratzinger's major weakness was he was very, he was very trusting, right? And also yeah. he wasn't good at, at, at reigning. In fact, I remember the late Cardinal Ch George, you know, of Chicago, he came to speak periodically at, at Mundelein. And so seminarians and current students, I, I was uh, studying for the, the STL, the licentiate at the time, you know, they, he was all talking about, he was talking about the conclave, the conclave, which elected Bergoglio as, as Pope Francis, and he said the reason they chose Francis is because they needed someone to really clean up the curia, which they thought Benedict would able would be able to do, but but he wasn't. You know, he maybe you know yeah. made made yeah. some key appointments, but just didn't happen. So but, the key question yeah. is, can any, can anybody clean up the curia? I mean, John Paul couldn't, Benedict couldn't, Pope Francis couldn't, uh, can't, yeah. and that's evident now, eleven years into this papacy, that he can't do it. He can't clean it up. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, before we close, there is one aspect when, when Pope Benedict was elected pope. He said famously, pray that I don't run away for fear of the wolves. Um, and some people have pointed then. So, well, who are the wolves? And did he, in fact, eventually succumb to the wolves that were at the door? No, you know, after re reading, you know, between Peter Sievold's account and then Gans Fine's book, um, I, its name escapes. It's put up by Saint Augustine Institute. You know, I, I, you know, I'm convinced because Gans Fine tried to dissuade him right from resigning. He was convinced yeah. that this was well, this was the Lord's will. Like I, you know, I don't. He's not a man that would, you know, that that would run. Um, I mean, in his in the speech he received at Subiaco, he received that award uh, right before John Paul died. Um, you know, he talked about the world needing another Saint Benedict. I think at the end of the day, he just, you know, he became that other Saint Benedict. Uh, yeah. And and time and time and time and time and time will tell. So I don't think he ran from the wolves at all, but rather he became like Moses, right, lifting his hands up up in prayer. Right? This and is why I, all the I I began by frame this by beginning talking about the importance of prayer, and then followed up with this thing about the wolves. Because you hear this criticism all the time. Oh, well, he did run away from the wolves. And had he not resigned, we wouldn't have gotten this horrible Pope Francis and so on and so forth. But it ignores, and that's the point I was trying to make, ignores the fact he wasn't running from the wolves. He understood where the wolves were, and he thought that I am going to serve the church better in prayer and seclusion than I would be in trying to confront this openly. The crisis is a spiritual one. And the reason why the church can't seem to reform this is because the mere practical measures of bureaucratic rearrangement are not going to address the deep spiritual malaise that afflicts the church. That's going to require prayer and fasting. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Roland. I think it was his desire to follow in the steps of St. Benedict. No, no. So. I mean, and that, and that he, cho he chose the, the better part. And it, it also serves as a corrective. I mean, the other reality is we've had a kind of hyper papalism, right? Everyone wants to treat all the words of the pontiff, regardless of the occupant, as equally weighted. And it's just not not the case, right? I mean, the Pope is a servant to the truth, like everyone else, right? He is a servant to the servants of of God. And that, you know, that act of humbly and courageously stepping down or that kind of helps to free the office that it's not about the particular occupant what's most important is the uh, is the is the office itself because yeah. the these varying occupants they'll they'll come and go but it's not about them right because they are to be the vicar of christ right he is that the is right the truth and the life
Right. And I want people to know that because, I mean, there are people that are angry at me because they know I'm critical of Pope Francis, and I am. I have big problems with him. But I also hold back from scorched earth denunciations and so forth because this too shall pass. Pope Francis will someday pass to his judgment. And we want a papacy intact after he's gone. If we start going all scorched earth and just, you know, we're sh we're shooting at gnats with a bazooka we're, we're we're, you know, we're going to destroy the papal office in the act of trying to destroy this particular pope. And, and I, I think this is as, as, a, as a strategy is very bad, very, very bad. I think we can be critical of the pope and yet respectful of the office. And that is why I think we need to look at Pope Benedict and not be critical of him either and say, here's what he was doing. You know, in the yeah. end, he, he was offering himself up as, as a prayer warrior for the church, in my opinion. But anyway. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he lives that out, that pro nobis, right. He, and he enters, he enters in, right. Becoming a living sacrifice himself. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, I think my, you know, my final word would be, the words of Benedict uh, from his inaugural mass as Pope, right? That the happiness, you know, that we, you know, that we seek has a name and a face, Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist, right? That is the, the Christological center that binds both John Paul and, and Benedict Wojtyla Ratzinger, right? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, <laughs> as John Paul would say, <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> be not afraid. Yes. Yeah. John Paul was the great hero of my life. Uh, I entered seminary in 1978. And, you know, basically two months after I entered the seminary, John Paul's elected pope. And this was minor seminary. I was an undergraduate. And I just I tried to communicate to this younger generation who, if they have any memory of John Paul at all, it's of his later years when he was very ill. Mm -hmm. I try to communicate to them just how inspiring the first, say, 15 years, not that it wasn't all inspiring, but I just means in terms of the, the activity, the charisma, the the force, the magnetic force of the man for those first 15 years or so was just unbelievable. And it changed the world. It helped to bring down the Soviet Union. You know, it helped to stabilize the church after a period of enormous turmoil. And it's why he pressed Joseph Ratzinger into service because mm -hmm. he knew that he needed help in that project, you know? Well, I think no. uh, you would know this. How many times did Joseph Ratzinger say no to John Paul when John Paul asked him to be head of the CDF? You know, I think it's that, that German, you know, polite the Bavarian thing, right? You say no twice and then you say yes a third time. So I want to say he said no, no twice. And well, then eventually, see, I didn't want to, and yeah, then, and that's, then, you know, and, and then what we need to verify you know, is I think I read somewhere I think from George Weigel that it was Joseph Pieper. And speaking of Thomas, you know that that introduced the two of them. That's yes. we need to we need to track that down, right? That Joseph Pieper introduced these these two that were not just coworkers but were great friends. You know, and 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 that's ultimately that that friendship rooted in Christ. You know, has has made all the difference in the lives of of so many of of. A bishop's priest, two towering figures, lady, lady. Yeah, tower, the dream team. What I read, well, I think it was from Seawalt, maybe that it was three times, and the first two times, Rod Singer said politely, "No, no," and the third time, John Paul said, "This is not a request." <laughs> You know, <laughs> this is more like take this. I'm putting you under obedience to become head of the CDF. Uh, but yes, they did have a mutual respect for each other. On the level of yeah, and it, and it, and it, and it, it it's shown through at the funeral of Saint John Paul II when when Rath, Ratzinger was the the celebrant. People were like, "Wow, look at this Ratzinger!" Well, he was it was the same Ratzinger. He's always been that way. He just you know he got the public moment that he normally tried to avoid. You know? Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely, and uh, I I do believe they're a dream team. St. Uh, John Paul II has been canonized, St. John Paul II, and I hope someday that Pope Benedict is as well. Hey, Roland, thank you so much for coming. I fear I spoke too much and you too little, but uh, that's, be <laughs> no, that's thank because you, you, you uh, we, we think so much alike on these terms that 
you would say something and it would really catalyze my thoughts and I'd want to get something out. So excuse me if I, if I, you know, if I dominated the, too much, the conversation, I don't know, but I just love talking to you. I think you're a really great uh, interlocutor. Uh, you've done great work on, on Rod Singer and uh, you know, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, Larry. And the viewers should know this is round two, because the first time we did this, there were audio problems with the recording. And so I had to say, sorry, Roland, but the audio was bad. And he was a good enough sport to come back on a second time. So I thank you for that as well. No, happy to do it, Larry. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you.